That magic word linked with the names of Cool Guardy and Hannon girdled the world in the early 90s. Adventurous men streamed to the fabulously rich fields of Western Australia. Lured on by hope, prospectors struck out into the country never before trodden by white men. Infected with gold dust, men rushed madly from the scene of one find to that of the next. Rough mining towns sprang up overnight and vanished just as quickly. But the find of Paddy Hannon endured. Calgary quickly blossomed into Australia's principal gold mining town and remains so today. Few of the younger generation who pause to read the inscription and slake their thirst on the memorial water bag appreciate the importance of water to the town and industry. But to those old enough to remember the privations and tragedies of the waterless days of the 90s, the reservoir on Mount Charlotte, terminal of the 370-mile pipeline from Mundaring, is filled with something as precious as gold. Located in the semi-arid interior, Calgary depends upon the water scheme as much as upon gold for its very existence. Water brought stability and deep mining. Calgary developed into a town of wide streets lined with fine public buildings and well-stocked shops. The livelihood of the 25,000 people of the district depends directly and indirectly upon the price the world is prepared to pay for gold. Through the doorway of the Calgary School of Mines have passed many famous mining men. The school is among the foremost educational institutions of its class in Australia, and its activities are closely coordinated with all bodies interested in mining. Many of the problems that have confronted the industry have been solved by the school's research officers. Research is not its only function. Mining, like all modern industry, demands a constant flow of highly skilled technicians and operatives. The school meets that demand. Students supplement a sound theoretical training with practical instruction on the mine. Whatever large-scale mining is carried on, graduates of the Calgary School of Mines will be found. The Golden Mile, center of a small tract of gold-bearing country, which has returned 28 million fine ounces of gold and paid 32 million pounds in dividends to shareholders scattered throughout the world. Nine of the largest gold-producing companies in Australia are located on the mile. Mines are going deeper and deeper in search of the precious metal, which runs in a finely divided state along thin veins thousands of feet below the surface. The deepest shaft is over 4,000 feet, and underground the whole area is honeycombed with drive. Equipment spins ceaselessly, transmitting power and air to treatment units on the surface and men and machines underground. In the winding room, steel cable lashes viciously on the drums. The driver keeps a watchful eye on his instrument, and the cables run out and over spinning wheels high up on the poppet head. Miners sit quietly talking and smoking while they wait their call, but others forcibly express their views. Cages go up and down the shaft at hundreds of feet a minute, and in a brief while men are wending their way along narrow underground corridors. The day's work begins. Along massive rock formations, machine miners follow the gold-bearing ore, often without a glimpse of the golden color. The noisy rattle of the rock drill drums on the ears as the bed bites feet into the hard rock. A regulation length fuse fitted with a detonator is placed in each plug of explosive before it's inserted in the drill hole and tamping clay is forced into the holes over the explosive to keep in the expanding gas and minimize accidents. Western Australia was the first to introduce the cartridge method of firing as a safety measure. Fuses from each hole are brought together in a cartridge and ignited through a master fuse, and another few feet advance is made. 
Firing is restricted to a quarter of an hour before the lunch period and the end of the shift. Through side chutes along the drive, gray pieces of gold-bearing ore slide from the slopes above into waiting trucks. The battery-operated train treads its way along the dark drive to the pack where the ore is kept in readiness for haulage to the surface by the skip. Swishing up the shaft at the speed of a couple of thousand feet a minute, the skip comes to rest a few feet from the top of the poppet head and tips the ore into a storage bin. On the mile, deep and open cut mining go hand in hand. Miners protected by safety ropes work along the slopes of yawning open cuts. The ore is hauled to the surface in a nearby shaft. Trains then transport it to a central treatment point and crushing commences. Several stages of dry crushing follow. The finer material is screened out and the coarser material returned for further crushing. Crushing and screening is repeated until a uniform product of less than three-eighths of an inch is obtained. Carried by wide endless belts, the crushed ore passes to the mill where wet crushing commences. Grinding is carried out in ball and tube mills until the ore is ground to a fine powder. During the process, the pulp flows over corduroy strakes, which collect the coarser particles of gold. The corduroy cloths are removed and washed, and the concentrate stored for treatment. Ore larger than one two hundredth of an inch is separated by the classifiers and returned to the mills for further grinding. When ground to a fine, uniformly sized product, pine oil and other reagents are introduced into the pulp, which then flows through a series of flotation cells. Frothing and flotation is repeated in each cell. Air is drawn into the flotation reagents to form a heavy froth. Froth rises through the pulp and collects the sulfide minerals which contain the gold. The froth, with the gold adhering, overflows the cells and is pumped away to a storage tank. Tailings dams cover acres of land and appear on the landscape as miniature flat-topped mountains, the sides of which show the shovel marks of their builders. Worthless when built in bygone years, many of the dams are now being retreated because of the increased price of gold. Water guns wash down the dams and the pulp flows along launders to the treatment plant. Back in the mill, the concentrates from flotation, which have a high sulfur content, are filtered to remove moisture and then move forward through the roasters. Fed in at one end of the furnace, the concentrate is slowly raked to the other. Once ignited, the roast is sustained by the high sulfur content of the concentrate. Roasting converts the sulfides to oxide and enables the cyanide solution to leach out of the gold. The gold is dissolved by the cyanide solution and the solid discarded. Rich in gold, the solution flows into the precipitating tank in the gold room. Operations are now behind barred windows and doors. Zinc dust is added, and the gold is thrown out of solution in the form of black gold slime, which is scraped off the filters and held for smelting. The black gold slime is mixed with fluxes and smelted in about 100 pound charges. Furnaces are turned first to discharge the molten flag and then the bullion. Each 100 pound charge produces about 600 ounces of bullion. This concludes treatment on the Golden Mile and further refining takes place at the Royal Mint in Perth. The bullion is again smelted, and the chloride, principally silver and copper, are drawn off. Assays are taken continuously to check the purity, and when finally poured, it is 99.60% fine gold. 
Each year, Western Australia produces three quarters of Australia's gold, and more than half of that comes from the big producers of the Golden Mile. No event has had such a profound influence upon the history of Western Australia as the magic call of gold which rang round the world when Paddy Hannon made his strike in 93.